Good afternoon, friends, and welcome to another installment of Golondrinas Live Sessions. My name is Laura Gonzalez. I'm the Education and Volunteer Manager here at the beautiful El Rancho de las Golondrinas Living History Museum. We're located just south of Santa Fe, New Mexico, in the historic La Cienega Valley. Today, we're going to learn all about the historic process of tanning hides. You're going to learn about how to make buckskins, about brain tanning, yes, you heard that correctly, and so much more. Joining me here to share their expertise on the subject are longtime volunteers, Daniel Hart and Tim Wilson. Both Daniel and Tim have been volunteering with Las, Gol with Las Golondrinas for over 15 years. Both um, are sort of our mountain men experts here on site and they have been hide tanning for several years. You can also find Daniel flint napping sometimes. You can find Tim singing about the Ciboleros, which he'll also talk about in our segment today. Um, Tim actually is a retired opera singer, so hopefully we get a little bit of a taste of that during this presentation. He's known around here as the Hyde Tanner Tenor, or among his personal friends as the sentimental fellow with the mellow bellow. Um, if you've ever been out to Las Colandrinas and visited the Hyde Tanning Shed, no doubt you started your day off right with Daniel over here, who has usually not one, but two or three jokes to get the, the day started off right. Um, if at any time during this presentation you have questions for Daniel or Tim, please feel free to put them in the comments and we'll get those answered for you. I hope you enjoy. Now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Daniel and Tim. Hello everybody. I'm going to talk about the ciboleros. So in the Spanish language you have a vaquero, a cowboy. You have a caballero, who's a horseman. But a cibolero is a hunter of the cibola, which in New Mexico is the buffalo, cibola. When the fall harvest was over, they were looking for, for meat because they had plenty of sheep around here, but not too many cows, and there was an ample supply of buffalo, just about two weeks walk to the east. So in the fall, after the harvest, they would take the, the carretas, probably two carretas from El Rancho de las Colandrinas, and maybe eight people. And they would go east and meet up with others till they had a large band of people to hunt the buffalo. So they would head east until they saw off in the distance a big herd. Then they would make camp there. In the morning, the five best buffalo hunters, the ones with the fastest horses, would mount up and take their lance, was the best thing to hunt the buffalo with. And they would sneak up on the buffalo herd. And when the buffalo began to run, the hunters with the fast horses would run right up next to them and stab them right here, right in the heart. One buffalo would go down. He would ride further. Another buffalo would go down. And they're still running at top speed till finally four or five buffalo each hunter would kill. And it was laying on the ground. Then the people would come up from behind them and would skin the buffalo and take the hide and save it. They would cut off the tongue and put it in a, a barrel of salt to save it. And most importantly, they would slice the meat off of the buffalo very thin. And then they would put the carretas far apart, and take the rope, stretch it between them, and hang the meat in the rope. And in a few days, they had a big supply of jerky. Then they would load up the, the carretas and come back. When they, reached the village, when they reached home again, it was almost winter, and they would distribute all the goods that they had gotten amongst all the people equally. On one of the last trips they took in the 1860s, there was a very famous buffalo hunter, cibolero, named Manuel Mayas. Manuel was 
handsome and dashing. He was a great buffalo hunter with a very fast horse. But on this trip, he brought with him young Jose. This is Jose's coat. And Jose was only 12, but he wanted to hunt buffalo too. So Manuel said, you know, Jose, you need a good horse. You can borrow my horse and I'll use your horse and you can go buffalo hunting. And so they went and Jose did well. He killed a buffalo. But Manuel, not so well. His horse stepped in a prairie dog hole. He dropped his lance. It broke. It stuck in the ground with the tip up and Manuel fell right on it, killing him. Everyone was sad and they buried him. But on the way back, they wrote a song for him. So this song is a historic old song about Manuel Mayas. The first verse says, of all the Spanish on the plains, I had the fastest horse, but I disgraced myself one day when my horse stepped in a prairie dog hole and my lance ran through my whole body. De que los ibanos al viaje, mi caballo es más ligero, pero toco la desgracia, se que volco en tu cerro y en eso solte la lanza, y me paso cuerpo entero. The second verse is, it was three in the afternoon when I got my death sentence and I reached out my hand to my friend, but he couldn't help me. Como a las tres de tarde, la muerte me sentenció en los brazos de Uco Padre. Ven y la mano me dio en los brazos de Uco Padre. Ven y la mano me dio. And in the last verse, I say, when everyone back in New Mexico hears about this, they will all be sad because of the death of the Cibolero. Cuando esta noticia llegue, a Nuevo México enteró, todos tristes sentirán por la muerte de un Cibolero. Todos tristes sentirán por la muerte y un cibolero. That's the story of the Cibolero's. Well, we made it back home after our buffalo hunt, now we have to tan the hides so that they're worth something, so that we can do something with them. But first I'd like to tell you about a little antelope. This little antelope decided that she wanted to come to Santa Fe for the last fiesta of the year. So she got a little doeskin skirt, she painted up her hooves, put on some makeup, and she was walking just within sight of Santa Fe across a meadow when a herd of buffalo ran over her. After that, she was known as the very first self-dressed stamped antelope. <laughs> okay, what we're going to do, um, the very first thing you have to do once you've made your kill is flesh it. Obviously skin it and then flesh it. And I'm going to demonstrate a little bit here on this extremely rare New Mexico pygmy polar bear. No, actually it's a sheep. <laughs> Now obviously this one's already been fleshed, but using a dull scraper, you press all of the meat and the fat off of it. And you work the whole hide by, by moving it around on, a, on your beam here until you get all of that off. Once you get all of that off, it's kind of a nasty little job because you get a little bloody and stuff, but once you get all of that off, then you take the hide and you wash it so that you don't have any residue of the, of the fat left, because if you leave the fat on the hide, um, it, nothing will penetrate it to soften it, and it will also go rancid. So once, once you've got that done, once you've got all the meat stuff off, you put it up on a rack. Now normally we do this with a deer or an elk or a buffalo or something, but today to, to demonstrate this, all we had was a beaver. 
So we put it on a rack and we let it set for a day or two until it dries. And then we take a scraper, which has a, uh, a little bit of a burr on it. Again, it's not sharp. You don't want to cut the hide. And you scrape the hair off. You can see the hair flying. Once you get all of that off, then you also have to take a layer of skin or two off of each side. These are the epidermals on the outside and they protect the inner skin. So if you don't take those off again, it won't soften. And what you end up with is what we call rawhide. Now there's a whole bunch of uses for rawhide, like drum heads. Um, we made this pitchfork using strips of rawhide where we just wet the rawhide, cut it into strips, tied it on and let it dry and it hardened up. Uh, then we made a basket, a carrying basket, out of just rawhide, didn't even take the hair off. So it has a lot of uses, but it makes a pretty lousy pair of pants. You've got to use a lot of baby powder. So the next step is that we take it off of our frame, we wet it. Actually what we do is we take the brains of the animal. Now this sounds kind of, kind of gross and everything, but it isn't. Um, every animal has enough brains in its own head to tan its own hide. Uh, although recently I found one exception, politicians. So we, we take the brains and we mush them into some hot water. We smash them. We make it into a kind of a paste. Or if we mix it with a little bit more um, water, we make it kind of a, a slurpy. And we take the hide that we've taken off of the frame and we dip it into that and we let it marinate in it for hours or even maybe a whole day. The longer that we do it, the, uh, the more the uh, oils from the brain get into the hide and start softening it. Then we take it out after that and we wring all the excess out and we save the brains if we can use them again. We wring out as much as we can and then we stretch it. And we stretch it by pulling on it, by wrapping it around a post, pulling it back and forth by a rope, um, pulling on it, having three or four people grab an edge and pull on it. And you can actually see it stretch. And the more that it stretches, the softer it gets, the more the skin fibers fluff up. And so we keep stretching it until it dries. Now on a hot day, that may only be a couple hours. On a cool day like today, it might take all day. So you have to keep stretching it. You see that stretch? Once it's dry, then we have a piece of material that we can actually make something out of. You can see on this piece how much softer it is. Makes a much better pair of pants much better. But this is not the final step. If I hand this to my wife and I say, please make me a pair of pants. Well, these are brain tan pants, by the way. And she makes me a nice pair of pants. And I haven't done the final step on this. And then the next day she gets mad at me and throws me in the Santa Fe River. All those fibers, when I lay back down, it goes back to this. So you have to rebrain it and start all over. So the final final step that you have to do is you fold, fold the hide in half and you sew it lightly down one side so that you have a tube. And then you build a fire. Um, imagine that we have a fire here. We let it burn down to red hot coals. We throw rotten cotton wood on it. So we get lots and lots of smoke, but you can put your hand in it and not get burned. You want hot, you don't want hot. You want uh, just a cool smoke. So you end up with something like this. Now that smoke resin gets on there but while the fibers are all fluffed up and gets, gets between those fibers and should it get wet it will not harden again. So this whole process, if you're fast, probably about eight to ten hours on single hide. It took two and a half hides to make my pair of pants. So you can see the extensive work that went into it. It's labor intensive but it's a whole lot more uh, environmentally friendly to do the brain tanning 
than to use chromium salts or tannic acid or uric acid or something, some of the harsh chemicals that they make leather with today. So, and you can see some of the finished products up here that Mr. Wilson over here has done. These are all brain canned here on the ranch. And Tim being an excellent, excellent seamster, I guess that instead of a seamstress, <laughs> he makes incredible stuff. So I think we could probably take questions if anybody has any. If not, I'm going to have to start telling bad jokes. So Daniel, can you tell us a little bit again how long you said it's it's clearly very labor intensive. How long does it make? Would would these people take to make a full set of clothing? And would they how many how many clothes or how many outfits could be produced from from say a deer hide or a buffalo hide? Um, how long depends on how many people help. Uh, the more people help, the faster it gets done. For example, um, the Native Americans, before they could get canvas for their teepees, would use anywhere from 7 to 11 or 12 uh, buffalo hides to make a single teepee. Uh, that was uh, all of the women and the, and the children and everything got together to do that because it was about 40 hours of work to do a single buffalo hide. So it was kind of like a barn raising. Um, I, I mentioned that it took two and a half hides to make this pair of pants. Uh, there's not much you can do with a single um, deer hide, a gamusa in Spanish. Uh, this is two. That's, that one's two. Two, yeah. two deer hides to make that. Three to make those pants. So it takes several, generally. And of course, the bigger the animal, the more clothes or the more intricate the, the design, the longer it would take. Are there, um, can you do this with any animal? Would it be the same process? Obviously, you're, you're going to go towards your larger animals, but could you do this same process with any animal? Absolutely. Um, when you come and visit us next summer, when all this fun is over this year, uh, we can show you uh, several dozen animal skins that we have tanned, uh, everything from, from squirrels and ermines uh, to foxes and and all sorts of different animals, but they were all done with the same method. And there are other things you can use if you can't get brains. Um, mad cow disease kind of cut out getting brains from, mad, from the cows, which you could go to a butcher shop and get. You can still get pig brains on occasion, but you can use other things. You can use uh, meat split oil mixed with uh, ivory soap. You can use uh, egg yolk. Not the whites, but you could use a dozen egg yolks to do a, a one hide. So there are other things that, that are environmentally friendly that you could do it with. Interesting. So I see some of the clothes that you have hanging on the careta there. They're beautifully decorated with little metal buttons and ornaments. Where would cibaleros or hide tanners get the, the little ornaments to add to their clothing? Would a, would a local blacksmith make those? Uh, yes, but they would, they're trade items and they're silver. It was almost easier to get silver than it was to get iron. Because there are big, big silver mines in Mexico. So the trade route on the Camino Real, that was where they brought these trade goods up. Like these silver, these are silver buttons. And they're, they're spears. So you can open them up and have the side be open because underneath you are wearing some linen, and that, it makes it cooler. That was going to be my next question. How comfortable are these, are these clothes? And you know, summers, we, we generally here in New Mexico have mild temperatures, but in the summers it can get pretty hot in certain areas. Are these breathable at all? Are they comfortable? The, the hide tanning using the brains um, makes it so the hides actually do breathe a little bit. Breathe through it. Yeah, you can actually, you can actually blow through the edges of this and feel it. I mean, I guess that makes sense. It's skin, so it would be porous. Yeah. Would this be preferable to say wool? We've a few segments back, we talked about how wool was used a lot in clothing in New Mexico. Do, is there a preference between one or the other? Uh, the biggest difference that I see is that uh, the brain tan leather lasts forever. The wool wears out eventually. Um, and I personally have worn this in 90 degree days and not got hot. 
Uh, think how long a pair of Levi's last you. And how long, how old are those pants that you're wearing? 12 years old, I expect to get another 12 years out of them. Excellent. And Daniel, you mentioned that, t that Tim here, you called him a, what was it, a seamster? Seamster, seamster tailor. Um, as far as sewing these items of clothing together, what was used as the thread? Well, the best thing to use is sinew, which is animal tendon along your backbone here. There's animal tendon and you can just rip it up and rip it off. It makes great thread. Also, you can just use the, uh, the buckskin itself as thread. That's a good way too because then if it gets wet, it gets stretchy and it stretches at the same rate. But they did have linen thread coming up from traders. But sinew and uh, buckskin make great thread to sew things up with. And there's no sewing machines till 1857. They started off here in the 1700s. So most all the sewing is done by hand. All of it's done by hand, of course, no machinery at this point. Um, we have a question about your shoes as well. Your shoes are clearly leather as well. What would have been used as the sole? Um, the larger animal, um, like the buffalo or the elk or something, because you can see how thick. I don't know if you can see it in this, but you can see how thick the sole is so it doesn't wear out as fast. Yeah, this is buffalo here, and this is elk in these shoes. Called which were local Pueblo type moccasins. And this would have been widespread in New Mexico. A lot of a lot of the population would have been wearing either wool or leather primarily. Absolutely. Is that correct? Well, when the Spanish came up here, they brought their cottons and their silks, and they found that they didn't last very long. So I would say that the majority of the time they were wearing leather stuff, and, unless they were going to a fiesta like that poor little antelope. And what about cleaning? You know, life in New Mexico in the past was a lot of hard work, still is today. If they got nice and dirty out in the field, how would they clean their leather pants? Um, actually, I don't think they worried about that too much. No. Although, can, go ahead. Yeah, you can, uh, you can wash it uh, buckskin just the way you would wash anything. It, it washes nicely, so. As long as it's been smoked. This, right. this pair of pants right here, I actually threw in a washing machine one day and washed, and it still came out soft. Excellent. Now there's a couple of things too that, that we take for granted um, that came from high tanning. Like how about calling a dollar a buck? I've never heard that. You've never heard that? No. Oh, well that came from high tanning because um, one deer hide was worth one peso or one dollar late, late, later. So. That's where the term buck came from. Interesting. I love that story. <laughs> I have a little bit of a, I guess, a personal question about underwear. Is leather, was leather used to make underwear as well, or was underwear worn generally? I don't think so. No, probably, as you see in, in Tim's outfit there, he's using linen for a, an under yeah. layer. So it's more so undergarments, not necessarily underwear in the way that we think of the pieces today. Right. And Tim, you were talking a little bit about the Ciboleros and trade and commerce and El Camino Real and the Santa Fe Trail. How, how hot of a commodity were leather goods? And can you tell us a little bit more? You, you focused heavily on clothing. Can you tell us what other items might have been tanned and what other items might have been made out of leather? Well, as Dan said, uh, they, it was a big trade item, and they traded hundreds and even thousands of hides down the Camino Real to Mexico, and a lot of the buckskin that was made in this country even was sent even to Europe to be used in Spain, because it was very good for hunting, so men in Spain would have hunting pants made out of buckskin. And a little bit later too, a lot of the buffalo skins were used for belts for like the mills and stuff. So they would sew long pieces of buffalo together and use them for the belts to turn the machinery. So there was a lot of, of uses for the, the uh, skins besides just clothing. 
they used rawhide for trunks, like yeah. suitcases, because on the, the as the carreta was bouncing, the rawhide would bend. So it was better for luggage and, than anything else. All right, a couple more questions about um, the skills of a hide tanner. Are these skills, you talked about native groups uh, doing this and making teepees out of them. Are these skills that would have been acquired by the Spanish from their indigenous neighbors? Very, well, yeah, because it, we, people have been wearing tanned skins since the beginning of time. So Europeans knew how to make buckskin Everybody knew how to make buckskin. Even Neanderthal man, they think, made it buckskin. So it's a, it's a skill that everybody would have had. Yeah. Interesting. And the uh, some of the tools that you use, like the the scraper, uh, remind me what that's called again, Dan. A scraper. Just a scraper. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it might be something fancier. Uh, there isn't a, a really um, good name for it. Um, this would this would be like a two-handed beam scraper, I guess. Uh, again, they're not sharp. You don't want to cut the hides when you're working on them. So this one just has a little bit of a burr. And originally, uh, the, the Native Americans used stone. Okay. They could, they, you could see how it has an angle on it like this. Uh, they could easily flake a stone, a flat stone like that, and use it in a handle or by itself to, to scrape the hides. Wonderful, you answered my follow-up question. Um, my other question about the metal tools that you have, um, historically speaking, are those tools, would they would have been made by a local blacksmith and would yeah. you maybe have traded items with the blacksmith? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I might trade him a sheep to make me one of these or a couple of sheep because uh, the iron was so rare here in the early days. So interesting. All right. Do we have any more questions from our wonderful audience? I think you guys were so thorough <laughs> that we don't have any more questions. I'm going to come back in the screen here and, and join you gentlemen. Well, everybody, I hope you enjoyed another installment of Golondrina's live sessions on hide tanning. Um, thank you so much to Daniel and to Tim for coming out and taking time out of your, I'm sure, very busy schedules during this time. I think you've missed being out here. We have. Um, again, we can't say how grateful we are to our wonderful audience. Uh, thank you so much for your continued support and tuning in to our Golondrinas live sessions videos. And thank you so much to these wonderful volunteers. Las Golondrinas is home to so many wonderful and talented volunteers. And we're grateful that they've all come out and spent a little time with us and shared their knowledge. Um, as you can see from this presentation, um, this is one of those uh, demonstrations that, that is really more than a demonstration. They're not just talking about how it was done and showing you a little bit about the process. Um, these two gentlemen, and we have a few other hide tanners that are very skilled as well that join them in these demonstrations. Um, this is something that they do, um, that they, they make their own clothes. They make clothes for the display. The entire hide tanning display is lots of hours and uh, dedication on their part. So uh, we thank you for all of that. We appreciate that. Um, a couple of reminders, there's a few days left in October. Um, our site is open to walk around and enjoy the beautiful trees. I think you can maybe see a few in the background. Um, Las Golondrinas, this is a lovely time to be on site. So go ahead and visit golondrinas.org. If you're interested in purchasing tickets, we will be open um, a few days of the week through October 30th. It's a great time to bring the family out for a walk, have a picnic, take some beautiful fall photos. A reminder that the other Golondrinas live sessions that we've already done are hanging out right here on our Facebook page. Um, we also invite you and your family and friends to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can also find um, the series of our videos. And if you just go to YouTube, you just type in Las Golondrinas channel and you'll see all of the videos that we've done. Um, you can also find us on Instagram at SF Golondrinas, um, number of ways to reach out to us. So we hope to see you again for our next Golondrinas live session. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Bye-bye.